Hello and welcome to the second season of the Aviatrix Book Review interview series. I'm Liz Booker. I'm the host of the Aviatrix Book Club, the Aviatrix Book Review website, podcast, and YouTube channel, where I highlight and promote books that feature women in aviation. And you can find me at Literary Aviatrix on social media. We had a lot of new faces show up in the book club this month, which is so exciting. It brings a lot of new perspectives, a diversity of experiences, new connections and friends that we can make um, through this experience and just a richer conversation overall. If you are new here, please check out all of the videos or podcasts that I did last year interviewing authors for all of the books plus a few others. And if you have any interest in writing, please join us in the Aviatrix Writers Group and listen to the writers portions of those interviews where we talk about all things writing craft, publishing and book promotion. A year into this project, I am still committed to producing both the interviews and the website without sponsorship or advertising. And what you can do to help support me is to subscribe and to leave a review, especially on, on whatever podcast medium that you're using. You can subscribe to me on YouTube. Um, and then as always, be sure to review the books you read to help support our authors so that their books reach the broadest audience possible. My guest today is a former U.S. Navy helicopter pilot and retired Air Force Colonel. She is the first and so far only black woman to pilot the U-2 reconnaissance aircraft in its 66 year operational history. After retiring, she became a personal fitness trainer and participated in the second season of the reality television series, Tough as Nails. Her book, Shatter the Sky, What Going to the Stratosphere Taught Me About Self-Worth, Sacrifice and Discipline is the Aviatrix Book Club discussion book for January, 2022. You can check out an article I wrote about her for the January, February issue of Aviation for Women magazine on the Aviatrix Book Review website. And you can find her at her website, merylpingsdahl.com and on social media at dragonlady788. Meryl Tangsdahl, welcome. Thank you so much for having me today. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, you know how excited I am about this book because I have been stalking you for a year about it. <laughs> no, I'm just, um, it's not that bad. You, you weren't that bad. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? I want to explain it a little bit because I did kind of track you down out of nowhere. I'm sure it felt like from your perspective. Um, but one of the things that I was really trying to do um, is to build diversity into our reading list for the Aviatrix Book Club. Diversity of experience, diversity of fly, types of flying, all of that stuff. Um, but all, also diversity of race and culture and, and background. And when I went looking for books that featured women of color, no surprise, there just weren't that many. Um, and just to kind of put it in perspective, when I was on active duty, I worked with the first female helicopter, black uh, female helicopter pilot in the Coast Guard. And this was in 2011. Um, and so, and she was a brand new pilot, so pretty junior to me. And so when I started this project, I kind of went through the Rolodex of black female pilots that I had ever met in my life. And it wasn't very large, no surprise. And you were like the first one who came to mind because we randomly, I randomly fangirled you at an Udvar Hazi like girls in aviation day and like came running up to you and, and asked you to take a picture with me. And so I was like, I wonder where she is in her life right now. I wonder if she's retired and I was excited to find you online. And that's kind of how I tracked you down. And I was super excited when you said, well, as a matter of fact, I am writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> yes um i do remember udvar hazi center um that was a fun day because uh it's funny like you fast forward i mean was that 2010 11 yeah that we met so i mean um nicole malakowski was there and i distinctively remember her in a wheelchair with her husband uh thunderbird uh pilot and 
Um, I remember you showed me the picture. At first, I didn't remember your name, but you showed me the picture. I said, oh, yeah, I remember. And I remember the Girl Scout. It was it was a great time. It was great to be out there with a whole bunch of cool people and other pilots such as myself. So it was um, it was definitely fun. Yeah, it was cool. And you know what? I'm just going to mention this. It's not related to your book or anything, but related to something that I said in my introduction about how the Aviatrix Book Club has had a lot of new faces um, this month. I don't know if it's your book inspired a whole bunch of new people to join and join in the conversation. But last night we had a wonderful woman who is a docent at the Udvarhazi, which I think is totally cool. Um, but that's a really cool place. So oh, anyway. Wow. So for those people who might not have had a chance to read the book yet, can you give us an overview of what it's about? So the, the overview, it's, it's, a, it's a story about me, of course, um, memoir or autobiography. I'm still trying to figure out what the difference between those two are. <laughs> and uh, it talks about, it's broken up into four parts. So it talks about me growing up in the Bronx, um, my Navy days, my Air Force days, and then how that all culminates into where I'm at now. And um, it just basically s summarizes the person that I am and and how I became to be this first, you know, one of the claim to fame in the military is uh, uh, the first black woman to fly the U-2 uh, spy plane. So I kind of get into that and kind of dive into my life story to just say this is the type of person I am and this is what drove me to be this pilot, and uh, eventually this person in the Air Force? Well, I loved reading it. And um, I'm Thank sure you. you had a million stories that you could have put in there, but I really liked the ones that you chose. I feel like you, you picked enough for us to really get a sense of your experience, both you know as a child um, and then the Navy flying, which I can definitely relate to as a Coast Guard pilot. We went through very similar training. Um, and then going on to the U2 and the things that you've done since then, it, it's just a nice collection of vignettes and it's told with a sense of humor. And I laughed out loud so much in this book. It just, uh, really is indicative of your personality, um, in so many ways. And I also thought uh, that the way it was written was super accessible. And what I mean by that is like, you know, a younger person could totally read this, which I think was part of your goal. Why did you want to publish the book? So, I, you know, full disclosure, um, when I was in the military, I had a couple of friends approach me, especially towards the end of my career and say, hey, you, you need to write a book. People need to know about you. And um, quite frankly, I blew them off because I just wasn't ready. I wasn't in the I wasn't in the headspace for that. I didn't think my story was very unique, but I mean, other people are telling me this. The way I view myself is not how others others view me. I I'll just I have a blind spot about myself in these terms, like bragging about myself. And it was only until I was interviewing for the show Tough as Nails, the CBS reality show. And I started thinking about, okay, as I was going through the interview process, I said, all right, as I need to start telling my story, because if this all goes well and I'm on TV, more people are gonna wanna know about me and how I became to be this, this pilot and, and I think it's gonna take off. So. I started working with someone to write my story. The reason why I decided to do it in the way I did is number one, um, we're going through a time of COVID, the pandemic. It started in you know 2020, and I think people felt a certain way. And you couple that with a cup with the racial tensions and the underlying tensions that had been going on, and were coming to the surface. Um, I just thought people needed a place or a book that they can read where it's coming from a real person and it was coming from a place of authenticity. I, I wasn't going to give them a very dry version of myself because that's not how I am. Most people who know me know I, I could be incredibly serious and intense at times, but the other times I like to have fun. I like to joke around and um, I look at life a little differently. And I wanted to show people 
especially, um, you know, young girls, young girls of color, kids who feel like they've been dealt a bad hand and there's no way out for them, that they can look at my story and see this kid from the Bronx that had similar upbringings could become this incredibly successful person. So um, I wanted to make sure that they would read a story about that. Speaking of you being a kid from the Bronx, you know, the closest I've gotten to the Bronx is through uh, an author who was an advisor at Vermont College of Fine Arts, who is also a Bronx native. Her name is Co Booth. Um, I read uh, these when I was in my uh, master's degree program, Bronxwood, Kendra, and Tyrell, and they are all set right there in the Bronx. And um, it really gives me a sense of what that environment is like. And so maybe revisiting it through your lens, it it kind of gave me a fuller picture of kind of what you were up against, you know? Um, It doesn't sound like it's super easy to just navigate your way out of there, uh, especially without strong role models, which you, you, it sounds like you did have when you were growing up, but tell me about living there and, and the perspective of someone who has lived many other places since. So growing up there, you know, I, I grew up in Co-op City. And for those who live in the Bronx, they know where that's at. Co-op City is a, it's, it's a lot of buildings that are tall, you know, uh, single towers, double or triple towers. Um, there's five sections to it. It was built on a place called Freedom Land, which was an amusement park um, back in the, I think in the 60s or 50s. So when they built Co-op City, uh, my mother and father were the first in that apartment. And, you know, my mom owned that apartment for 50 years. So, you know, it was just like this next place of diversity. And um, in Co-op City, when I was growing up in the 70s, most of the people who lived there were either Black or Jewish. So um, I talk about, you know, watching, um, you know, listening to the old the older uh, elders sitting on the bench speaking Yiddish or speaking Hebrew. Like a lot of my friends were Jewish. Um, You know, my first party at 13 was a a bat mitzvah, you know? So um, I'm very familiar with that. And, uh, you know, it was that environment where, you know, that I talk about a woman who sat up by the window on the second floor and was watching the kids and, there was, you know, the village raising the child for real. Like if you did something wrong, you'd get in trouble. Not, you know, I I think kids today, they, they're on the devices. They, they kind of do a lot of things that are quite frankly, outside the boundaries of respectfulness. And, um, you know, parents kind of go, some parents go, oh, well, or, you know, there was not this, I'm going to go tell your parent and have them take care of it that's what happened when I was growing up. So, you know, I grew up in that environment. (laughs) Yeah. That was what was nice about living in military housing. I can say is that we all kind of kept an eye on each other's kids that way, but it doesn't feel like you get that everywhere anymore. No, there's definitely, there's, that is definitely a lost art and you know, where I live, how it differs from now. I live in a place now that if a kid's doing something wrong, And you say that to a parent, there's a whole bunch of reasons why this kid is doing it. Right. So there's a whole bunch of excuses made instead of like, okay, I'll handle it. Right. Um, Unfortunately, I'm still the same parent. Like if you tell me my kid's acting up, um, (laughs) I remember uh, my daughter last week. Oh, she did something. So it was really bad. We can't even get into it. (laughs) I, I, I will just say that the psychologist called me from school and I was not happy. And this was, uh, you know, last Thursday, uh, I had, you know, that I had a colonoscopy. So I was definitely coming out of, you know, the sedation and I get this call and I'm like, are you kidding me right now? And I, you know, (laughs) and I, and I said to her, I picked her up and she goes, she goes, mommy, how was your day? And I looked at her, I go, oh, better than yours. Total silence. She just put her head down and just started walking. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah, we got a lot to talk about when we get home. 
So, yes. Well, speaking of kids with spunk and uh, maybe who got in trouble every once in a while, it sounds like you found your fair share. <laughs> I did. Um, I, I did a lot of things. Some are, are written in the book. You know, I was a, I was a kid. <laughs> no, I was too. Uh, you, you actually fared better than I did during those years, to be honest. But so how was it for you to assimilate into the military culture? So, I mean, as a kid, I definitely, um, you know, I, I definitely did some things that bordered on the criminal, but, uh, you know, thank goodness there were some people, we'll talk about mentorship in a second, some people who kept me on that, the straight and narrow. Um, how did, how was it assimilating into the military? So what I liked about the military is that you have a group of people for a goal. So I, I always wanted to be an astronaut. I knew I, I wanted to be a pilot. I knew I had to be a pilot as one step, stepping stone to being an astronaut. And what I liked about the military is that it's, there's a sense of discipline. There's a sense of ownership. There's some, there's camaraderie there. Um, Cause we all go through the same stressful times. So, you know, you're working with a group of people from all different backgrounds and uh, you're working towards this common goal. It really is reminiscent of, you know, Star Trek in real life, right? So you have these military officers that are from this academy, they're working to explore, they're working on this mission and they're working together. So I see you're smiling there. Like, I know, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're such a nerd. <laughs> you and your track <laughs> stuff. That's what I'm smiling about. <laughs> I am a nerd. I am a I know. 100%. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Going back to, you know, I'm the same as you. I, uh, I knew very early at like by five that I wanted to be an astronaut. And I don't even know how I figured out that I had to be a pilot first. What made you believe that that was possible for you? I think because no one told me I couldn't. You know, it was one of those... And even they, if even if they, you know, in the seventies, girls and boys had a specific role, right? So, I write about that when I was growing up. I had this little jet. I had this little book to keep my report cards in, and on the back of it, it said, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" For girls, it was like secretary, mother. Um, um, what it? What was it? It wasn't. It wasn't uh, airline hostess or it might I forgot what it said and on the the boys side it said firemen policemen all these other military um and I just knew that was you know I just I, it anything on the girl side did not feel right it was it was like no I don't want to do any of that but you know being a policeman or a fighter firefighter I you know people would make fun of me and say oh well that's a guy's job why would you want to do that and in my mind I was like you know so what that looks cool going into yeah. a fire to save people cool <laughs> walking around arresting people that are bad that's cool being in the military with <laughs> with weapons is cool uh being a secretary shuffling papers not cool like it just and then you became an officer in the military and you were shuffling papers. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Nor at Northcom. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with being a secretary. It's great. But I, I could not. I could see myself in a role of the action, not. Hmm. Yeah, it's still even today, it just doesn't doesn't do it for me. Yeah. Nine to five jobs are not. They're not my thing. So tell me about this path to, to um, Navy flight training. And I, I know you talk about it a little bit in the book, but you knew that the military was your best chance at being a pilot. Is that why you decided to join and, and pick the Navy? Yes. Yeah, so when I went to college, I, you know, I, w I went into the electrical engineering program at uh, University of New Haven. And I picked engineering because... I knew that 
I wanted to be an engineer. It was going to be a fallback for me. It was also rigorous enough and interesting enough for, for me to do. I didn't pick aerospace or aeronautical because I just couldn't find the school with the program that I wanted. And I fell back to electrical because I had done some summer work working in electrical engineering in that field. So um, it was easy for me to do electrical. And I knew the courses that I would take would be, you know, they would translate into anything aerospace or aeronautical. When I was in school, I did join Air Force ROTC for two years. It wasn't my thing. Um, no offense to the Air Force. It just the personality was not says it just the wasn't retired my, Air Force Colonel. <laughs> I know, I know, I know how we come full circle. It just wasn't for me. And the Navy just it, it I said, okay, I could I would like to be on a boat flying off the carrier. You know, Top Gun was out during that time in the yeah. 80s. Um, I actually What's not in the book is that I talked to, and it's because I, I I don't know if this made the book or we cut it out. There was in Co-op City, there was this officer that used to, they had patrol in Co-op City. They have their own kind of security. And there was this one retired cop who was part of security. His name, and I kid you not, was Officer Bacon. And <laughs> and him and I, we used to talk when I come home from college, I would tell him, oh, you know, I mean, I don't know if I want to do the Air Force. I don't know if I want to do the Navy. ROTC won't gar guarantee me, a, a, you know, a flight spot. You know, I, I think I'm going to have to do direct commissioning. And he's like, well, why don't you do the Navy? They're better pilots. You know, he was like his brother was a Navy person. I'm like, I'm not sure. So I would talk to him about this. And when after my second year in ROTC in the Air Force, and I said, no, nah, this is not for me, you know, I started looking more towards the Navy. And that's my choice was solidified when I went down to Pensacola. Um, I was dating a guy at the time that was graduating down there. He was a corpsman. And we were in Pensacola and I went to the museum and I looked at all the astronauts on the wall and looked at all their backgrounds and found that a lot of the astronauts were naval aviators, at least there. And I said, OK, I'm going Navy. This is how it's going down. And that's that was really what how I picked it. That's so great. <laughs> it's so great. Like, I honestly, well, you know, this this isn't about me, but there's just so much like, <laughs> talking about full circle. I shared with you that I was a high school dropout, but I had done Navy junior ROTC um, in my first couple of years of high school, when I was at an aviation magnet school and it was moving away from that was kind of why that was my demise, um, among other poor choices of my own making. But, um, when I tried to enlist, I tried to enlist in the Navy first and they wouldn't take me because it was the end of the first Gulf war. And so they were drawing down and I tried every other service. But Navy was my first choice. Um, and the Navy recruiter was the one who actually referred me to the Coast Guard recruiter, which was cool. Oh. And then I later found out that my grandmother was in the Coast Guard Reserve during World War II. I didn't even know that. So that's crazy. But then, you know, and then I find myself at Navy uh, flight training, <laughs> you know, <laughs> later on. So I went through Whiting. You went, um, you went to Pensacola, did your officer candidate school there. I love the story with your friend. Is her name Elizabeth too? Yes. Her name's Liz. Yes. Yeah, she sounds fun. I want to meet her. <laughs> you know what? Uh, we're trying to do a Vegas trip. So, you know, I'll invite you out to Vegas. You, you can meet her. Um, you know, we've been, man, we've been friends since we've met. So, well, that's how it happens in those environments, <laughs> right? Like those, that's fast friendship in, in that scenario. And, and the story that you, you guys share both of you, cause she has some writing in there too, which is fun. Um, and then you went off to Corpus and yes. flew the T-34 there. And then you came back to Whiting for your um, TH-57 training, right? Yes. And then you went on to fly the 60. I went to fly 60 Bravo's East Coast. So uh, which, uh, which helicopter training squad, HT-8 or 18? 18. I was an 18. Okay, that's cool. VT-2 in my primary, the Dewar Birds. Uh -huh. Oh, the do yeah, I was in uh VT28. Or as we like to joke, the DOR birds. 
<laughs> that that was a hard um I you know I didn't stay at Pensacola because uh I, you know I, it wasn't my first choice. I, I wanted to go to Corpus because I heard the uh uh course rules were easier and I was like, yeah, I don't want to deal with you that. know what? They probably were because I'm pretty sure one of my downs was because of course rules. I couldn't <laughs> recognize the damn chicken coop because there were like 18 of them and they all look the same. So, <laughs> yeah, they, they said, go to Corpus Christi. You just turn here and then go to the, the sh- you know, towards the water. I was like, all right, I'll do that. Solid advice. <laughs> So one of the scenarios that you talk about in the book, and, you know, um, I think as pilots, we've all had these like moments with other pilots who do stupid things, but this guy who he was pilot in command and basically tries to fly in the water at night, uh, inadvertently talk about that a little bit. And then I have some things to say about that. (laughs) Right. So, I mean, this was when I was first, I had just gotten to. Uh, HSL 48. And this was our first workup cycle. We were, we were doing um, JTFX. I don't know if they still call it that. So joint force training exercises off of, uh, we, I was on the USS Normandy. So we were flying off of the cruiser CG 60. And it was, it was my first time as a helicopter second pilot. Um, one of my first, you know, training missions or training stuff out there off of uh virginia and we were it was a late night we were doing uh a two bags so we we're flying about seven hours so two bags of gas that's what we did. two bag flight or maybe it was one bag and it converted into a second bag so we were gonna go fly for seven hours it was probably around I don't know, three hours into the flight. And it was night. It was no moon. It was one of those dark nights. And we were playing sub games. We were searching for a sub. H-60s, anti-submarine warfare is one of the primary missions. And we know the sub is there. You know, we have sauna buoys in the water. We know. um, I don't know if we went active on the sub, but we knew it was there. But we had to get a visual ID at nighttime. And I think drop you know, drop a flare on it or something to say that, hey, we've actually got you. But we visually could not ID it. We were just having a hard time. At that moment in the H-60s, we were just limited to night flying no lower before, no lower than 200 feet, if I remember. And the reason why is because about a few months ago or a month or two ago, a crew went below 200 feet at night and uh, it was over the water and they took a perfectly good aircraft and put it in the, in the drink. They just put it in. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Were, were you guys on night vision goggles? No. Okay. Okay. So um, MVGs, we weren't using MVGs at the time there. Um, so there was this big whole a standard operation procedure change, SOP change that no lower than 200 feet at night. And we know it's there. And the aircraft commander suggests that we can go below 200 feet at night if we're an, you know, coupled approach. So the H-60, you could couple the approach and actually do, you know, aircraft assisted approach to 50 feet and hover. So, okay, that's legit. It didn't say it in the rules, right? So um, I was like, okay. He's like, bring out the checklist and we'll go through the checklist. So as a 2 p.m., I'm looking through the checklist. So we've all agreed. So it's m- myself, the pilot in command, and then the air crewman in the back. So it's three of us, which was a mistake number one, right? So to agree to this. So I'm going through the checklist. And as I'm going through the checklist, I can't find it. I don't know why. I'm just fumbling through. I'm a, I'm a 2 p. You know, I'm not that... I don't know what was my problem that night, but I, the more I couldn't find it, the more flustered I was getting and the more I just couldn't search. Anyway, my head was down in, in the checklist and unbeknownst to me, he started to do a manual descent. So the air crew member was strapped in, but he was looking outside the side doors, looking for the sub. So he didn't feel it was pitch black. He didn't know we were descending. 
And uh, so it's taken me a while. And for some reason, I feel a little bump on the aircraft and it didn't feel right. And I look up and, you know, of course, the first thing you look up is the altimeter. I don't know about you, but I do. And we're descending through 20 feet. And uh, oh, yeah, I, I don't want to puke just thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, the pit in your stomach when you know, you know, this it's about to go down. And I just remember yelling power and I grabbed the collective and I, I pulled an arm, you know, I, I pulled hard and, you know, I got under controls and the air crew member, he actually put his head back in and he said we were at six feet. Cause he has a, he hasn't, you know, rat right out in the back and uh, we started climbing away and it was just total quiet in the cockpit. And we were, yeah, you know, needless to say, I mean, that was a scary moment because, you know, just before we deployed, you know, we had that crew that took a perfectly good aircraft and put it in the water, stand up and tell us, you know, in the Navy, when you make mistakes, you're telling everyone about it. So um, and it's not as punishment, but that's part of your accountability for the most part, at least yeah. back then when I was going through. So um, it was a very quiet aircraft for the remainder of our mission. Um, and even when we got back, I think we were just all shooken up. Um, we did not debrief. Like it was one of those, like, we're going to bed. Good night. And, uh, you know, for me, it was a lot. It was a lot of lessons learned about this particular individual, the way he conducted, you know, how we all conducted cockpit resource management, because it's not just him. But for me as a 2P, I learned a lot on that sortie. So, you know, it just stuck with me forever. And that's how I conducted myself. What's the joke about the Navy and the Air Force where it's if you're in the Navy and it doesn't say anything about it in the regs, then you can do it. And in the Air Force, if it doesn't say anything about it in the regs, you can't do it. Have you ever yeah, heard that? So, How's that go? Yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah, the, the um, <laughs> saying is the Air Force tells you what you can do. The Navy tells you what you can't do. Yeah. So, every- yeah, it's a small nuance, but it's it's. It's very important because, you know, I used to I I came with the assumption, especially when I went in, when I became a Navy instructor at Moody Air Force Base, I I thought that the Navy and the Air Force trained their pilots the same, but they don't. There is definitely it's not a good or bad thing. I think all pilots in the Navy and the Air Force are good pilots, you know, great pilots. They do really well. But the thought process, there's a small nuance about that. I think Navy pilots. You know, they just have more maneuvering room to do things. But with that comes a lot of responsibility. And if you make an error, you better be ready to talk to your peers. You know, you're going to sit at the long end of that table explaining yourself. In the Air Force, you can always you can always look for a higher authority to give you permission. You're always looking for permission so you don't have to assume that responsibility. Well, that's great and all, but when it comes to leadership, eventually, eventually you're that higher authority. So you have to be able to make those decisions on your own. And I think the Navy starts you out earlier, but they hold you accountable for it. So I, I love that the Navy does that because I think as, a, as an officer going into the Air Force, I was just more mature in that way. And I was willing to make decisions that would make people feel uncomfortable or maybe not in their comfort zone for my other peers, my air force peers. But I knew, I knew how to stand my own ground and I knew how to defend myself. And uh, I was more confident as a result of that. You know, speaking of accountability, um, the question that I had was what happened after that flight? Did you report that incident to the safety officer? What went on? I was confused about the after. Right. So the after, we never talked about it. Wow. We never re- we never reported it. Yep. Bad on us. We never reported it. We never talked about it. Um, it was one of those things that what happened on the ship stayed on the ship. Well, I can tell you, I saw so many people um, have that bite them in the ass. Because, you know, there are three of you in that plane. (laughs) 
and somebody's going to run their mouth at some point. And so it's really interesting, the culture and how it's evolved, you know, over the years, it was still evolving in the Coast Guard at the time from sort of the previous sort of cowboy ish culture to a more safety conscious um, environment. So I could totally see it. Right. So it was one of those that you, you just didn't talk about. I mean, there were things. I mean, there are a lot of things that happen on the ship that. That don't get talked about. Um, and I'm not saying that's a is, is it a good or bad thing? It depends on what it is. Yeah. I mean, that was definitely a lesson learned for us. Um, like I carried that with me. I mean, even to this day, I mean, I I, I conducted myself. Um, a you know, I did not put my trust into the aircraft commander, you know, as a new helicopter second pilot, I realized that my knowledge and my worth was a lot more and I need to speak up because if I didn't at that point, we would have been again, another crew talking about what happened. And uh, yeah, you were oh, lucky. Yeah, incredibly lucky. There's yeah. nothing, there's nothing else to say about that. It wasn't, yeah just just luck i you know i just i'm thankful that i looked up at the moment that i did yep. i knew something wasn't right i i can't explain yep. anything more about that so yeah. um i rather be in that point i rather be lucky than good any day cuz once we hit the water being good oh. yeah i think we would have died ah, yeah yeah well i knew my air crewman i knew my air crewman would have died cuz he was outside of his seat Imagine that thing going upside down. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Well, you know, even the civilian pilots, it, that story resonated with them in terms of like flying with different people and how much uh, you count on on the other person in the other seat, regardless of their supposed, uh, you know, vast experience or whatever. You always got to be on your game when you're at the controls of a plane. So. One hundred percent. Yeah. But. Uh, we're talking about crews with more than one pilot and you have a lot of experience doing it all on your own, which is crazy to me. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how you got there first. I, I, you know, I appreciated that you shared, um, some of the challenging, uh, experiences that you had, including this one, you know, with the, the over the water incident, but then also just sort of the interpersonal issues and people, uh, maybe targeting you and maybe you don't know why that's happening <laughs> or what's the motivation <laughs> behind it, but it's happening nonetheless. Um, and that was an incident that I think kind of helped get you, uh, to a new opportunity, which is neat. Is that how you would describe that? So are we talking about, um, you know, when I was in the Navy and yeah. just the whole, right. So you know, I will, I will preface this with during that time as, and I, and I talk about it during the book, during that time in the Navy, the H-60 community, our squadron was highly competitive, which like most very competitive. There were, there were two women. There was myself. No, there were three or four women in that squadron. Um, and, you know, we flew off of small ships. So, Small ships definitely have a very competitive nature. It's a dog eat dog nature. And so I was definitely that type of person that I could be abrupt. I could, my personality was one of aggression. Um, I was young. I was hungry. And, you know, I did not make qualms about, I was comfortable with conflict. I will say that. Right. So you have to be because in this environment, because it's so competitive. Yeah, you can't survive with kind of competition <laughs> yeah, you unless you're able to hold your hold your ground. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, conflict is something that you, you want a piece of me. Let's go. Let's take it outside. Like I I was ready all the time. So, um, you know, that kind of wears on you and. And maybe some of that was because of my personality. But I also knew that even though I might be comfortable with conflict, I was also highly competent and very good at what I did. I knew I was a I was an aircraft commander still as a lieutenant JG. So 
you know, I was, I knew I was very good at what I did. And I knew that could be threatening for some people, especially as a woman in a, in a squadron. Now, was that the reason? I don't know. You, you never, you never really know. You can only, you can only um, find facts on a, a lot of things and cross things off. And eventually you start getting into, oh, is it the gender thing? Is it the race thing? Is it the personality thing? You, you just keep going. So I, I will say some of it might've been personality, but I think, I think some of it was gender. I think some of it was race. And part of the personality part of it is I was in conflict with my OIC officer in charge of my second deployment. Him and I got into it quite a bit on the boat. And when we got off the boat, again, what happens as he stays at sea, right? You'll hear that a lot. And a lot of things that happened with us stayed there because I was that type of person that I wasn't going to air dirty laundry of the debt. It just wasn't my thing. But I think that came kind of full circle because I worked for him at the squadron and he was able to do things and create this narrative about me, which was not necessarily 100 percent true. So was he mad at me? Probably. Could he get at to get at me because of my my abilities? No but he could pay the narrative and that's what people do. So um, it affected me and it affected my performance report yeah. that that's just bottom line. So I knew not having a good performance report coming out of my, my C tour. And I knew that was going to affect me for test pilot school and anything future on. So I knew that was a, that, that could be a potential showstopper, but um Fortunately, I had some mentors and I told them my desires to, you know, do something maybe more joint working with the Air Force because I was I was curious how the Air Force did their policy and did their stuff. And my friend came through. So I was very grateful for him to give me that opportunity. And I was really grateful that my boss at the time was so arrogant and he believed anything that I said. And I was able to kind of downplay the the job that I eventually got was instructor flying the T6. And um, because I think if I had told him, he probably would have done something to stop that. That was a good play on your part, by the way. Yes. Um, you know, we talked about my friend Liz and when she read that part, we, we spoke about it. And she said to me, she said, Meryl, I remember that when you called me because I, I would confide in her. And she said to me, she was like, that was the first time you did not know what to do. Like she, she said, Meryl, you saw the writing on the wall. You knew what was happening. And you told me, you're like, Liz, I, I have no idea what the next move is. I, I don't have another move. Like yeah. I, I can't confide in anyone at the squadron. I couldn't confide, confide in my commander. All I had was one guy who was a detailer, who was my mentor, who I was talking to, and he believed me. And I was like, hey, you know, I could be difficult, but this stuff is going on is is out of bounds. Something it's I'm getting screwed. So, yeah, he was able to help me. Well, now that you've started talking about that uh, in, you know, you talk about it at this moment in the book and then in future moments. And I know that I couldn't have survived as long as I did in the Coast Guard without having people here and there that I could reach out to who trusted me, who believed in me and were willing to invest in me. Um, even when I was in the middle of a shit storm <laughs> wherever I happen to be, uh, that I couldn't see my way out of. So the same kind of stuff, I mean, you want to talk more about that mentoring that you received mentoring that you chose to pay forward and how that have impacted your life. Right. So, you know, I, you know, mentoring is a, is a constant fluid cycle, right? You're mentoring, you're helping other people, mentoring people, people are mentoring you you always have to keep that going. Right. And I, and I say in the book, if you're not mentoring, you're wrong. And because there are people, 
you know, for me in the Navy, um, I had this one person who, you know, he flew with me. He was my, he was an instructor of mine. Um, he was a friend of mine. He was also a man of color and he had seen before me the things that go on in the squadron. And he can, he, you know, he calls, he calls, um, no pun intended, he calls a spade a spade. Like he calls the truth, the truth. And he, he could tell by how I was describing the situation that this was kind of a setup and he was able to help. He knew he couldn't help me in that moment, but he knew what other outlets, how can I get you to move on? He, he also, he was able to set up an appointment with, or not appointment, an interview with me with the commander at the FRS fleet replacement squadron, or what people remember as the, uh, you know, the, um, the rag, as they called it, I don't know if they still call it that to be an instructor in the H 60. And he, and the commander did want me to go there. Um, but then this other opportunity came up. So my friend was, um, you know, definitely in my corner to help me do that. Um, uh, but yeah, mentorship is key. Um, I, I tell people now in the military, it's not about finding someone who looks like you, who, you know, it's about, or, you know, looks like you in any way. It's about someone who's aligned with what you're doing. And for me, that's, those are the people who I found in, in my life, whether it was as a kid finding Miss Harriet, who gave me Star Trek books to, you know, feed my curiosity and, and feed my obsession with Star Trek to, you know, General Shanahan, who retired as a three star, who didn't know, know me from anything. All he saw was my record and asked the question, why is a black female who's about, who has an, a line number to Colonel getting out of the military? I want to talk to her. I want to figure out who she is. And through that, he, he started mentoring me. He went to the Pentagon. He, he started doing those things. So he liked the person that I was. He liked the person I was on paper and then got to know me. And so it's, it's just about finding people who are in your corner and uh, yeah, who are aligned with you, who walk in the same direction as you. So that's what I tell people. And when I mentor, I mentor people. I don't, I don't care what you look like. I don't care if you're ethnicity. I want to know, do you have goals? Are you hungry? Can you persevere through the tough times? Can you get up when you fail or get kicked? And, you know, how can I help you make those connections? And if I could do that, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, there's this thing about affinity, you know, that we, talked about at least when I was on active duty we had affinity groups this that and the other thing but the word affinity um I feel like it played a lot in um in my experience in watching the way that mentorship relationships developed or started and I guess what I'm getting at is that you know you can be someone senior and and look closely across the board and make sure that you're reaching out equally or as appropriate to the people who need you. But as a junior person, it's harder to identify who among the group, if nobody does look like you, is going to be supportive of you. Um, because people don't naturally, and, and the example I use is flight school. I was an alien at flight school. I mean, I was prior enlisted. I was a woman. I was a mother. You know, I had been in for six or seven years or five or six years at that point. And those guys didn't know what to do with me. They knew what to do with my male peers who were single and who were down at oh, Seville Quarter every weekend. They understood how to connect with them, but they didn't know how to connect with me. And I think that that's, you know, I feel, I, 
feel for people who like me in that situation um, don't maybe don't know where to look. You know what I mean? I, I understand that would, that that's hard. Like, um, <laughs> yes, that is hard. I had, uh, when I worked in the physiological support detachment on the air force side, there was an air force, um, tech sergeant. He got picked up by the Navy for flight school. And he was a family man. He was an artist and he was going to go to OCS. And I told him, when you go to flight school, you're going to be the old guy with kids and you're going to be, you know, you know, you're going to be the one you're not hanging out. You're not drinking the whole time. And um, I told I told him, I said, that's OK. Play with your kids. Have fun. Enjoy the time off that you're going to have when you're either at, at Corpus, I said, go to Corpus, don't go to Pensacola, those course rules kill you. And, <laughs> and I said, uh, <laughs> and I told him, um, you know, there might be a few families there, but you know, you might, you know, you and your wife have to be that team with each other. Right. So for single parent, you know, single parents, that's going to be difficult, but I will say, um, for example, when I was, um, I'll give you another example. When I was at NORAD Northcom, I, I felt, when I was there, I felt alone in terms of, you know, people were at the staff tour who had sponsorship there. And, and when I say sponsorship, people who got those by name requests to get them there. And here I am coming in. I don't know how I got these orders. All I knew I was trying to be a squeaky wheel because I was coming from a command job at Palmdale where no one was really looking at me. And I remember saying to myself, I don't know what I'm going to do next. And um, what I started doing is I started making appointments for mentorship with random people in the building, like for the J5. Um, I worked for him momentarily till I got kicked over to J8 and I made, <laughs> yeah, I'm that crazy. I'm that crazy. Uh, you did the rounds at the joint staff. <laughs> I did. I did the rounds. Like I would, I, that was when I talked to general Scobie out there. I met Dr. Croach, who was one of the highest civilians there. She saw me in the hallway. Like I started just popping up on people's calendars. Hey, sir, That's can funny. you give me some mentorship? And because I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And he's like, and, and I remember, I don't even remember the, the J five's name, you know, he's a two star. And I was like, sir, I need some help. I need some mentorship. Can I come to you if I need some help? And he's like, uh, I don't know. And I'm like, okay, thanks. And then next I'm with general Scobie. Hey, sir. That's awesome. I, yeah. I, I, and I did that at the Pentagon also. Um, I would just show up to people's offices. I roll up in there. And people are like, can I help you? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm just looking around. Um, hey, this is the AA. Oh, Ms. Z works here. Oh, can I get an appointment with your deputy? And they're like, why? I'm like, I don't know. I just want to talk. <laughs> That's what I would do. That's as simple as it was. And I started <laughs> becoming known around the building. Same at Nora North, Northcom. I, I just started. Well. I, it's a good strategy, I guess. It takes some confidence to be able to do that. Probably a little easier when you're a little more senior. <laughs> it is, but I was a major at NORAD Northcom. Um, uh -huh. No, 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 I'm sorry. You I was a been. lieutenant colonel. No, I was yeah, lieutenant I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, so um, it, when you're a little senior, but I kept thinking in my mind, I know this is crazy, but what do I have to lose? I don't right. have a mentor. I, ha I don't have a mentor anyway, so sometimes people don't remember what you did, but they'll just remember you. Oh, I saw her before. I don't know where, but uh, <laughs> oh, was, I know her. She was loafing in the office. I don't know yeah, why just, she was <laughs> just walking around. So, that's um, so great. I, I'm not, yeah. I don't know if that's a great strategy, but when you have nothing else to lose, why not? Yeah. You know what? I love telling the story about this one woman who is a good friend of mine now, 
but she was a couple of ranks junior to me. She was off on her own in Puerto Rico. She was feeling isolated and she just cold called me one day and said, will you be my mentor? And I was like, okay. She was like, by the way, they call me squirrel. And she's, <laughs> she, and I was like, okay. And then she, we ended up being stationed together um, in Los Angeles and we're good friends now, but yeah, it just, I, I had to admire her for just like looking anywhere, especially when she was feeling isolated for whatever support that she could get. And I gave it to her. So, yes, yeah. I, I think, um, I think as I moved up the ladder and I got to meet more, um, one stars, two stars. I mean, these are just normal people who they too are looking for the next thing and looking around and some of them are uncomfortable. Um, I remember once General Shanahan and I talked when he went to the Pentagon and I was there, um, I would get on his calendar and we would just go to the executive um, lounge or not executive lounge, but the executive uh, lunch area because mm -hmm. there were several in the building. And we would just talk. We, we would just talk about random stuff. And I just realized he's this, he's just this cool guy. Yeah. I, that's, I had the good fortune to work in some joint environments um, as well, Jai out of South. Um, and then as the SDO working for Southcom out of Barbados. Um, and I had similar experiences where I, I was someone who, um, you talked about being feisty. <laughs> there was nothing that brought me more joy than to find a bully army 06 who was like trying to tear people down and to pick a fight with him. Like that brought me joy. I would actually go seek it uh, when I was bored. Um, but for the most part, like the flags were, you know, they, there were some who were like just super brainiac, hyper-focused. And then there were others who were just people, you know, and right. thinking about what's next for themselves. So I was fortunate to have those kinds of mentorship uh, experiences as well. Not enough to get me <laughs> to 06, <laughs> but to 05 from an E1. So I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> That's a you're a Mustang. I mean, Mustangs are they're like unicorns, man. They're, you know, I mean, it's meeting a Mustang is is an awesome thing. Well, speaking of unicorns, Dragon Lady, we have to talk about this U2 because that's your claim to fame. And I've got my Dragon Lady t-shirt on, which I wear to the gym all the time. And it gives me like that extra spunk. So like I really get, get a great workout when I'm wearing it. But um, so you transitioned to the Air Force yes. and you did this whole selection process for this crazy aircraft. I, it's just insane that that thing actually flies, that it's been flying for 66 years and that you flew around in it. So tell me all about that. Yeah, the U2, I mean, U2 Dragon Lady, it's, you know, the pilots, the brotherhood, the sisterhood of the U2 is great. Um, you have to be a little not quite right to fly that aircraft because it's single seat. Um, it flies like a plane up at altitude, but down below you're fighting that thing to land it i mean because you know with wings like that she doesn't want to land bicycle bicycle uh gear configuration she doesn't want to land you know so. you talk a lot about the landing um but somebody <laughs> mentioned uh they were talking describing what the takeoff is like and i don't remember you doing that but what is it like like how do, does it balance on those little wheels to take off like how does that work so you have the outriggers, which are, which are what? So when the U2 is flying, so it's a bicycle landing gear configuration. You have a main gear in front. You have a tail wheel in the back. On the sides of the wings, you have these things called tail wheels. So they're outriggers. They help the aircraft when you're taxiing it in and out. Before takeoff, there's some pins to keep the tail wheels in. Once those pins are out, for takeoff, as the aircraft is going along the runway, as wings pick up speed, wings flex upwards. So when they flex upwards, those, I'm sorry, they're not tail wheels. They're called pogos. The outriggers drop off. I call them tail wheels in the beginning, but they're small, small wheels. We call them pogos. 
They the drop one off. described them as like training wheels for the wings. They are, but they're they're just used to help the aircraft taxi. Because yeah, okay. again, you have the you have the tail, you have the bicycle landing gear configuration. If you didn't, unless you have a you know a great fuel balance, the one of the wings are going to drop. So yeah. that's not. So the pogos are just there for taxiing. Once you take off, in theory, the pogos should drop off once the wings flex up when you have enough airspeed over for takeoff. Crazy. Okay. <laughs> so it's yeah, it's. I've never had a situation where a pogo has stayed on the wing after takeoff, but you can have a hung pogo situation, but basically you got to be careful because now it's, it's, you know, uh, a wheel that could drop off at any moment. So again, you're flying over houses. Don't do it. You know, you got to go somewhere and try to come back for, you know, a low approach to see if you can dislodge it. Um, no, you don't rock the wings because there's a warning for that. Um, someone died doing that. So you have to just be, yeah, yes. The hung pogo could be, a, you know, it's, it's pretty benign. Just don't make it worse than it is. Well, hello again, Meryl. It's great to be back. I wore the, actually the same shirt again. So I just wanted to make sure there was no, did you wear the same thing? I did not. (laughs) It's dirty. I wore it to the gym the day after we... (laughs) After we talked, I just want to let you know that there's this thing called a washing machine. Yeah, I get to that every once in a while <laughs> when I get to my housewife duties, as you call them, apparently. <laughs> yes. Well, I say I got I got housewife ish to do, but we won't curse yeah. on here. That'll. <laughs> yeah, that'll piss my husband off because he does most of the laundry around here anyway. So <laughs> uh, my husband, <laughs> that's another that's a podcast for another day. I know. Husband. <laughs> very strong women in life. Yes, actually, we we will get to a little bit of that. But when we left off the other day, um, we were talking about taking off in the U2. We were getting ready to talk about flying the plane. We finally got there after talking about all of this sort of, um, you know, how you deal with conflict uh, in your squadron and and mentors and all of that, flying the helicopter and all that great stuff. So now we finally get to the U2, your claim to fame. And... um, I had questions about how to take off um, and you kind of explain those, but what else should we know? I mean, you, you definitely describe it really well in the book. Um, oh, thank you. Thank but you. But what, what should we know about the U2 that's also unique? What's unique. I mean, it's a single seat aircraft. So uh, you, you're not, you know, you're not really talking to anyone. You could talk to someone on the radios, you know, occasionally if you want to, but you don't. So you have to be, you have to have this mental strength of being able to be comfortable with yourself. And I think it's funny because during COVID, like when everything locked down, uh, I was in my happy place. I was like, Oh, okay. Get to do stuff. I did get to do videos, but it it seemed like a lot of people were not comfortable with themselves. And I, I found that interesting people, you know, a lot of mental health things started coming up and it's just like, um, you know, you're your best advocate. So, get to know them. You know, that's so interesting that you experienced it that way. I had, so I consider myself like a borderline introvert extrovert. So I can, I can put on a show, I can do the extrovert stuff, but then I need to, to recharge. I don't like get energy from that. It drains me. But I was like, woof, those flights all by yourself up there. Like, I don't know if I could handle that. But when you're talking about COVID, you know, I set my life up when I retired so that, you know, I had my day to myself to work. I had the house. To, I had, I, I set up a battle rhythm as soon as I retired, zero 500, go to the gym, you know, cleanups, everything like, just like you would on a ship so that I would be disciplined. And then when COVID happened, I was surrounded by people they were like making a mess everywhere and it drove me crazy. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, you know, when, yes. So I, I hear that because, um, you know, I have two young urchins that I call them lovingly call them. And uh, when COVID hit, you know, we, we started fostering like a, right. our first foster during that time. And 
um, it was, I mean, it was a challenge, but what we did, what my husband and I did, we like, we maintained the battle rhythm every morning. They get up at a certain time. We'd all get dressed. We'd all do stuff. I was, um, you know, I would do like this three, two, one workout just to start the day three, you know, three minutes of cardio, two minutes of, uh, strength and one minute of abs to just get it going. I, I posted just because some people were in a rut. They'd stay in their pajamas all day. And I, I couldn't, I didn't understand that. So, yeah, the rhythm was messed up by the family being there, but you know, you started a new battle rhythm. So I, I, f- I feel that probably most military people were able to weather the storm better than civilians, just because, you know, when you're deployed and you're on a ship, um, I remember seeing a meme um, with Kermit the Frog. I, I don't know if you posted it or I something. Think, no, I didn't post it. I'm thinking we're. I think we're thinking about the same thing. Yeah, it's like it's like um, you know, COVID with civilians, and his hands are waving in the air, all frantic, and then like they're like military people, and he's sitting back on the couch with a cup of coffee, just chilling, just being in this happy spot. So yeah. it was, it you know, it was just definitely it wasn't that much of a change except I did a reality show during COVID, but that, that, yeah, except for that. that was something, that was something unique. That was a one-off. Oh my gosh. And we have to talk about that too, okay. but we just got off on this tangent um, because you were so isolated in the aircraft. And yeah. I find that like, I don't know, I guess, you know, you're, you, you get comfortable in the thing that you get proficient at, but I feel like that's a really long time to be alone. Yeah. You know, it's only, over eight hours. I mean, what's the big deal? You know, so <laughs> you get to talk to people. I mean, you're doing the mission. You're, you know, you're checking sensors. You're talking to other people. You're talking to ground troops. You're, you're trying to figure out the battlefield, how you can best be placed and talk about like where you, you're, you're most suited as an asset. So there are things going on, but there's transit time that could take a few hours. And, you know, you can draw, read. Really? I know you said that you were reading the magazine when you're flying and I'm like, whoa, yeah, solo. (laughs) Yes. I mean, there's an autopilot. So you just. Hmm. Oh, Jack LaLanne. (laughs) He invented the Smith machine. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, man. (laughs) That's crazy. And then you you talked about the sort of physio physiological pressures that it put on your body and some of the long-term damage that you may be experiencing because of it um, and that other pilots have experienced. But then when right. we were on a call, yeah, you were talking about, well, you talk about it. Right. So, I mean, at the time I was flying the U-2, the cabin pressure was set at about um, 29,000 feet approximately. So for all those who don't, let me paint a better picture. It's like being in, at the top of Mount Everest and you're breathing hundred percent oxygen, but your body's feeling that physiological effects. So you are exposed to quite a few things. You can get uh, DCS decompression sickness. So in the form of the bends or the chokes for, you know, divers understand that, or you could get neurological damage because you have these bubbles moving around in your body. And for some reason, depending on the day, if you have enough, you know, hydration, if you're tired, all these factors, all these little things factor into it. Right. So for us, for you two pilots, what you have to do before you fly a high flight, you have to breathe 100% oxygen before takeoff, one hour before takeoff. And the reason why you do that is because your tissues love 100% oxygen. So what it will do is replace any nitrogen that's in your body with that 100% oxygen. So basically, you're like off gassing, like, you know, when you get a new yeah. piece of furniture and it smells like plastic and it off gases after a while and it s- smells like your house. And um, so that's what we would do. But still, it helps minimize that. But I guess during the time that I was flying, a lot of us had experienced more severe symptoms of DCS. And uh, again, some of my friends got it very badly. Um, We, you know, during that time, we almost had a class A mishap, which means uh, for those who don't know, class A is I think the, the rules were the cut line was over a million dollars worth of damage that might've changed since then and permanent brain damage or loss of life. Right. So um, we had a gentleman who, and it's documented that experienced DCS, 
you know, through the flight, but he cleared the symptoms and there was some, there was some, uh, uh, ambiguity of do you continue a mission if you have some DCS like he felt joint pain he felt better he inflated the suit but then he continued on and then it started to uh, progress in a dangerous way so he had neurological damage and um, he almost crashed the aircraft but he luckily landed um, it's a great story uh, you know uh, if those out there it's intense, names, yeah, it's intense. It, um, just hearing him tell it, his name is Kevin Henry a uh, great guy great pilot um, but he, he suffered then he had to go through a lot of, I'll say therapy for lack of a better term right now to kind of get back to some sort of normal. And then he was probably the most severe, but we had another guy who had other issues. Um, other people were just having issues. So they did a study during the time I was there and they found that most of us had these, uh, white spots or brain lesions. So. You know, I, I participated in the study because I was curious, you know, who doesn't want to see what their brain looks like? So, yeah, yeah. So I found out. So we don't know the long term implications. Um, we just know that. Maybe something will happen, something may not happen. Yeah. Wow. That's okay. it's, so since then, you talked about how the plane has been um, reconfigured, right? Right. It's been modified. They actually uh changed the structure. So the cabin altitude now 15,000. So that happened, that happened right as I was leaving as the commander at uh, Palmdale. So uh, they were, we were in talks to get that done. And I think they started retrofitting the aircraft right shortly before I left. So that was in 2010. So when I got back into, when I got back in 2013, most of the aircraft were the single seat aircraft were at 15,000 feet, which it made a difference. I mean, when you fly U2, so our missions were you'd fly once and then you would, the next day had to be a down day. So you were doing no activities. The following day was a ground duty only, and then you were eligible for a flight. So we flew once every three days um, because it, it makes you tired. Our, our rotations when we deployed were typically somewhere between 60, no more than 90 days, just because of how tired you get flying the line consistently. Yeah. So it, it takes a toll on you, but I do it all over again. That's awesome. I was just thinking, you know, if we had a listener out there, a young person who was interested in being a YouTube pilot, your path to that was very unique, but you were around other pilots who took different paths. What yeah. advice would you give a young person if like that's their one dream in life is to fly the U2? How would they do that? So I would definitely you know, join the Air Force, that would be that would be the goal, right? So um, because the U-2 is only flown by the Air Force. If you want to go another branch of service, you could do the way I did, but you're still spending like 12 years in that service and then you're doing an inner service transfer. But you start off what I, I know the Air Force is starting a program right now in UPT where one student per year if they get selected, could go directly to the U2 program. So they're trying to take a person right out of training and put them in the U2. So um, I was in touch with one person who is, it's a pilot program that they're starting, no pun intended. But um, I'm, I was in touch with the person that's coming out here that is just done with UPT. He's going to start flying T-38s and go to the U2. So we'll see what happens. Wow. And, and if that if that works, then... There'll be students, a few selected students who can bypass the interview process. If that doesn't happen, what you have to do is pick an aircraft and there's, you know, you need X amount of hours. I don't remember. There's a website. Uh, Beal has the YouTube application website on there. I think at the time that I applied, you needed, I don't know if you needed about 1500 hours or, or maybe it was 2000 hours and a thousand instructor hours, you needed both instructor and flight time. So you had to be pretty experienced to apply for the program. Um, so that's what I would say. You're, you're frowning. I'm so that's very interesting. That is a, there's a wide Delta between somebody who has thousands of hours and has been an instructor and somebody's straight out of flight training. Yeah. Like, what do you think about all of that? 
I think it's going to be interesting. I, you know, it depends on the person, right? So some people, you know, they get to the YouTube program T38s. Maybe they have a little bit more of a challenging time than the actual, than the U2. Uh, cause we fly the T38 as a companion trainer, but it'll, I, I just think it'll be interesting. I, we have to see who this, the student caliber is. I think there might be a, a learning curve there and it depends on the person and how much they want, to, how much they want it, how much effort they're going to put. They may change up the curriculum for this person and give them additional flights to get them up to speed. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's interesting and exciting for those young people who are uh, uh, who really want to do it and get the opportunity. I hope right, they do so, well. Right. So I think, don't quote me on this. I'm not sure. I'd have to check with my friend, but I think they still have to interview and still do three flights in the U2. So part of the interview process is flying the U2. So you do three flights. And if you are trainable, they will ask, they'll hire you on. They'll say, hey, are you interested in being a part of it? If not, they'll say thanks, but no thanks. So you know, it's a two week process. Yeah. 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 So we'll see. How did yours go? What was the hardest part for you? <laughs> the hardest, the interviews with the commanders and stuff went well. Um, I think I tell about, I, I'm almost sure I tell about the story when I talked to the, the director of operations for the training flight um, uh, about the jar of Vaseline on his desk. Did I? No, I didn't. <laughs> that one is not standing out to me. I t- can't, please. Okay, okay quick, <laughs> quick story during my interview. It might be in there, but I don't remember that one. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if it got taken out, but uh, I've told this story before. So quick story. During my interview process, you have to talk to the commanders of the 99th and the 1RS. The 1RS is the training squad. So the commander of the 1RS wasn't there. So I talked to the DO, director of operations, second in charge. And I walk in and I'm in my, you know, my dress blues in the Navy, everything, you know, I'm looking really, you know, spiffy, very professional. And I'm sitting there and we're having a conversation. It's going well. But I'm looking around his office like I'm just looking at the pictures on his wall. I'm looking at his desk. I'm just checking it out. And what I notice is this huge jar of Vaseline on his desk. It's just sitting there. And I'm like, hmm, eh, nah, that's a little interesting. So we're done with the conversation. And he goes, well, Meryl, you know, you know, nice to meet you. Do you have any other questions? And I go, and I start getting this serious face. I go, sir, um, yeah, I have a question. It's, it's been bothering me for this, you know, since I've been here, since I came in your office. And I, and I really, uh, I really want to know. And, and, you know, I'm just... I'm not sure how to say this or anything. And I, you know, I look concerned. So he starts leaning in because he's like, well, what's wrong? What's what's going on? And I go, well, uh, what's up with the jar of Vaseline in your desk? <laughs> and he, he just stops. He goes, what? And I go, well, what's up? <laughs> and he goes, well, uh, uh, you know, puts on the tap dance shoes. It starts dancing. And I just have this smile, crack the smile like, he had no good reason for that to be there. He couldn't come up with anything. He was just like, well, you know, sometimes, you know, the guys are playing the joke and, blah, blah. you know, I don't remember what he said, but he was tap dancing. And I said, oh, oh okay, sir. Thanks. And I got Lord. a bit left. I thought for sure that was going to end with, well, you know, when we fly the U2 and we put the <laughs> suit on, we need Vaseline to lube up. <laughs> he had he nothing. Was, he had he, nothing. I totally caught him. I caught him flat footed. And then he's, he told me later on, he goes, at that moment, I knew you were perfect in this squad. Because <laughs> I had them all leaning in ready, like to give me some mentorship and to be all great. And I'm like, yeah, what's up with that jar? That's so great. <laughs> so that's your, that's your sea time right there in your I, Brooklyn. <laughs> I, Bronx, Bronx. Bronx. <gasps> and your Bronx. I'm a terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it was, um. You know, that's so good. Yes. So I, I always tell people the U2 is the, the people there landed are not quite right. Like there's there's good camaraderie, good sense of humor, you know, slightly raunchy, not over the line, but it's fun. I tell everybody and I don't even know if I've said I, I tell everybody. Well, I actually when I reported to the Joint Command and I had like this crew of they were mixed military and civilians, most of them were prior military. 
all men, of course. And I was going to be in charge of these guys. And I was just like, listen, I grew up in the adolescent boys locker room. I have pretty high tolerance. Some things will cross a line and you'll know when they do. <laughs> yes. Look, I mean, you know, I mean, I was raised in officer candidate school when the drill instructors were telling us to, to get together nut to butt. I mean, this is how right. like, it's right. like, like some people now may be offended, but it was very crude. It was very direct and you understood. Okay. And then, and then the drill instructors had the nerve. Like if there was a girl with a boy tight like that, they would come in and put their hands in between us <laughs> to make some more spacing. I was like, I was yeah. like this place. This place is uh... yeah you just kind of get like um <laughs> indoctrinated into the culture into the boys locker room culture and at some point you just have to assimilate for the most part to survive it and, and then and you get are... like and then i too so you and i i think are pretty similar i too have a a sense of humor about a lot of it as long as it's not you know, directed at humiliating somebody or, right. you know what I mean? Right. So, you know, my, you know, my mind could go in the gutter, but you know, you have to know your audience, right? So you have right. to, in the military, there are some people who maybe didn't have that upbringing um, and that's okay. They just need to be comfortable in the environment. And the moment you start making someone feel like an outsider, then you've crossed the line and you got to make you got to make it right. So, you know, if you slip up, I think a lot of a lot of people have that. Some people have that, you know, response like, well, they need to, tight, you know, toughen up and have thicker skin. It's like, no, you need to kind of just dial it back when they're around because yeah. maybe yeah. elevate, elevate the maturity level of our <laughs> interactions just a touch. Like, yeah, like so. But I, I, it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, just, just be a little more classy. And then when you're yeah. with when you're with the other people, you can say what you want, you know, say what you want within reason. Yeah. That doesn't cross the line. But yeah. yeah, I you know, being on the boat, being um being with the Navy, um, you know, I was I was a sailor first. So yeah, I have a mouth. I have <laughs> I have my mind could go in the gutter. This this is just I can hang with the best of them. I mean, you, there's a point that you, I, I, I talk about it in my first deployment, you know, all the guys had all these, you know, Playboy magazines and, you know, naked pictures. And there's a point where I like, dude, this does not interest me and it's annoying. So, you know, my, my way to combat that was, okay, I have a playgirl. Yeah. I thought like that was to see, great. You like to see boobs. I like to see other swinging things. How about that? And they're like, oh, no, we don't want, no, we don't want to see that. I'm like, why are you so sensitive now? Oh, d d does, does this bother you? Well, too bad. I love it. <laughs> Those are such good stories. <laughs> so great. Cracks me up. And, and it, I love that you were able to have a sense of humor about those things and it, it, yeah. you didn't let them shut you down. Not everybody responds that way. And, and you know, it's, a, it's an evolving culture always. It is. Um, and again, for those people who don't take that avenue, you know, just be you and, and yeah. say something and set your boundaries. Right. Yeah. Right. And right. people in leadership positions can set the tone, too. So absolutely. Right. Yes. Not my problem anymore, but definitely <laughs> thought a lot about it for a long time. <laughs> Good luck, everybody. <laughs> Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, setting the tone. When I was a commander, my my uh, detachment, they had a problem with cursing way too much over there. There were two problems. Cursing and flatulence was an issue. Yeah, okay. I, I had one guy that would like like crop dust people. <laughs> and I was like, bro, this is disgusting. I was like, we're going to have a jar. If you crop dust, this is five dollars. Seriously, go do it in your office. Close the door. We can't have <laughs> again. Yeah. <laughs> like, seriously, seriously, with crop dust. And he would laugh about it. You are in the adolescent. And I keep saying boys. And I, I am always so, so careful not to, like, make gender generalizations. But honestly, like. Yeah, I, I, I will say 
99 okay 95 percent of the times it was a male and then the, the rest of the time it was you yes <laughs> <laughs> oh my god the impression that we are giving of our professional military <laughs> right now but hey it, you know what we have our serious side we do have our very serious side right because i mean there's times that you you know, the job and the mission are serious. People get hurt. Things happen. And it's it's serious a lot. So you have to find a way to decompress. And, and you know, why not? Did someone just come in your office? My daughter just came to the door and did, I have glass doors and she's like this. <laughs> <laughs> like, get out of here. You, you had that mom look like when yeah. my son, like I, I looked up because I thought the kid was opening the door and I would have been like, no, nope. I would have just shook my head. Yeah. No, Gone, yeah. gone the other exactly. way. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of which, this family thing. So, yes. um, and you talk all about this in the book, but you've got, you know, you met your husband. Uh, I love that story, by the way, the way that you guys uh, met. And yeah. then it's you creepy. waited a lot. It's creepy. <laughs> it's, that creepy. it's not creepy. We met online. People I know. Do it now. Mm-hmm. We set the tone before all this, you know, all, all this other app. online tinder tinder and i don't remember yeah you know. and then you waited uh several years to have children and had you first so yes. how did that change your um career attitude and, and like how you looked at the world so my son i mean i, I tell a funny story that i was i was interested you know at one point i had to wrap my mind around the the fact that I could not be selfish anymore. Right. So I had to say that, all right, if we have a child, you know, priorities have to change. And it it took a couple of months to like wrap my mind around it and say, okay, a lot of branches and sequels in my head on how this could flow. Cause you don't know, kids come in and um, they just, uh, they just do whatever, you know, they have no idea. It's not their fault. So, um, when he was born, I was in my staff tour and it didn't really affect anything. My At that point, I two things. I was eligible to retire out of my staff tour. So I would have had 20 years. Um, I would have been coming up on 19, I think. Or I was coming up on 19 years. So I knew if I dropped my papers, I would stay to 20 and I could get out. And then or try to go back to Beale and work in the deputy OG position, which would be the next step for me. And uh, so I said, okay, let me, let me, chill. let me, uh, who's the ops group commander at the time at Beale. And I didn't know him. So he probably tells the, the story funnier, but I called him, I cold dialed him one day. I didn't even send him an email. And I, and I was like, Hey, sir, my name's Merrill. I want to work for you. But he tells it the more longer story that, you know, I, I was kind of like. I told him, like, uh, just ask the people around who I am or I did something like I did something crazy. Google I, me. Did you say Google do, me? it wasn't it wasn't <laughs> quite Google me, but I was like, sir. <laughs> and he's like, who are you? And I go, well, sir, I'll send you my resume. But, you know, you can ask the squadron members. They I'm Meryl. You, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows me. And he did. And he's like, oh, yeah. The notorious. Come on you can work. Yeah, come on. Yeah, notorious. He's like, yeah, come work for me. I'm like, yes. That's why I stayed. So every time, you know, I made a decision, I was like, okay, I need to be ready. If something happens that is going to affect my son, that I'm ready to leave. You know, I had to, I had to have that mindset. Like, it couldn't be a surprise. And none of the things that happened were a surprise. I mean, when I got the 365 orders, I knew they were coming. I knew it was my turn in the hopper, but I knew depending on where it was, where it would be, how long that I, it might generate retirement. So, um, and it, it did. So uh, for my son being there, it just changed my priorities, Um, especially at a younger age. For me, I just wanted to be there to raise him and help raise him and give him input. Can you imagine my husband giving the most input into my son? Oh, no. I don't know him. But in my house, that happened a lot. So it depends on the guy, I think. 
<laughs> yeah, no, my, my husband's awesome. He's good. He's a good guy. <laughs> he always gets mad at me. I give him a hard time. But um, yeah, the reason why I, I decided when I got the orders was because my husband was still doing his reserve stuff. And, you know, there was going to be some lap laps in who was watching Flynn. So um, I was like, no, I can't have that. And I, I thought about it this way. My mom worked as a single parent to give me everything. And now I'm here and I have a lot more and I'm able to give that to my son. I would do my mom a disservice if I didn't, you know, take care of my kids. So that's that's how I felt about that. And it, it made the decision easy and it made it easy to walk away. Well, yeah. You know, again, not that this is about me. It's about you, but to just offer like another perspective or a different experience for people who, you know, are going through their careers or in the military and making choices. I had an, I had sort of the opposite experience because I was surprised very early on, um, by being pregnant and I made the choice and it was a conscious choice. I, I, um, considered my options and I had the baby. So I was a junior enlisted person with baby. So I was in the coast guard for 28 years and I was a mother for 26 of those. And early on the choices that I was making, I was, I was separated from my son, but in the way maybe that your mom um, looked at things, like I was making sacrifices to make his life better. Right. Um, I wanted to make sure that I could provide for him and um, advance. And so it, it felt like it was soul crushing, soul crushing. Cause I went to sea with baby at home. Um, you know, after he was a year old, I went back to sea and that was really, really hard. Um, and I felt guilty about that forever, but now he's in the coast guard and he's at sea. So <laughs> He turned out okay, you know, but, um, but so as I progressed and I got more senior, um, I, you know, when I was junior and I was going along, my primary focus was providing for him and making the best life that I could for him. And so I could look him in the face, you know, and say, you know, we got to move again, but this is for you. You know, I'm doing this for us, for a family. And then as I got more senior and my husband got more established in his career, it got harder and harder to be like, Hey, this is really for you and not right. for me and my ego, you know? So, right. Yeah. yeah. So we, you know, I had Flynn at 41, so I yeah. was already at that point. And that's why I said, look, you know, I say at the end, to what end can I stay in the military? I can stay in the military till I make one star, get passed over or, or do whatever. And, you know, that's that's a choice. I mean, I think every woman has to make that that choice at the end. I have friends that have left their kids six months after for deployment um, yep. or, or like you. And it's hard. Um, I'm glad that I was in that position. I don't know if I had Flynn, you know, in if I was, well, I would have tried not to have a child while I was flying because in the YouTube, you can't be. Yeah. That's yeah. Once you're pregnant. Role. Yeah. <clears throat> right. That's a different aircraft. So I did twice. Option. So, <laughs> yeah. but some people like if they're flying, if they're flying tankers and stuff, they could, they could fly till second trimester, keep going, which I think is awesome. But yeah, for us, it was air... third trimester. Was it in the helicopter? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Can you imagine? I flew she... till five and a half months with my daughter. I did not fly with my son because I was an elder <laughs> <laughs> pregnancy <laughs> high risk because I was high 40. Because I was 40. Why are we high risk? I was like in the best shape of my life. I was doing half marathons. Like it was uh, nothing. I had had some miscarriages too. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah my yeah, you know, I I had that in my mind, but I got pregnant very quickly. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, it happens with me too. Yeah. What happens with me too? <laughs> I was like, I want to be a, I want to be a teenager. <laughs> what is this anyway? So, yeah, that's that's what I thought. So, I mean, I, I'm glad I did it the way I did. 
Yeah. And it sounds like, so you went on to um, retire and start personal training. And, and I, you know, we've talked about it and I quoted you in the article that I wrote about you that it affords you the opportunity to have the flexibility to be with your kids and still be able to work and inspire and mentor people. Talk a little bit about that. Right. So, you know, coming up on retirement, when I had my son, I actually got my first certification in training um, when uh, when I was on uh, maternity leave. So, you know, you know, I, I don't know, I had two or three months off. So I got my certification via um, AFA, which uh, I was already thinking about training people. Matter of fact, I was training one of one of the people in my office. They, we'd go down to the gym and I, I train him and I was working with him and all that stuff. And uh, I always wanted to, I don't know why I wanted to do it because one, I like the workout aspect. I like to understand people working out with someone on a physical level makes them, it's almost like it becomes this mental mind body connection with that person. Cause you, you're making them tired and then they start to open up about stuff and then it, they start to think about things and I'm able to get more to them on a psychological level to help them get their goals or attain other goals. So, I mean, I work out with some people who want to join the military and they want to have better push-ups or they want to have better pull-ups if they're joining the Marine Corps. So I'm able to do that with people. And it was, I don't know, there's something satisfying for me to watch someone else be successful in what they want to do and their journey. I, I don't know why it's, um, I don't know, it gives me a little dopamine high. I don't know what it is. It just, uh, it's good. I found that more, um, I found that better than just flying for Southwest or American. You know, it's great money, but I think the job satisfaction wasn't going to be there. And I was in a position that I was retired. My husband's still working. You know, my son, when I retired, was four. I could take him to school. I can participate in some of the school activities if I had to be forced. And, you know, I could be there. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that. Like, um, <laughs> I volunteer at the library because I'm a book girl. Really? I. That's it. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of tiger moms here where we live because they want their kids to be the best. But I am so, like, I want my kids to socialize with other kids. I do not want to see the drama. And, um, yeah, I've had this. <laughs> All right. I'll give you another story. <laughs> this is a recent one. I won't, I won't get into the, it was right after my, did I, t- did we talk you about told me that one? Front? Yep. The col- yeah, we got that one. The colonoscopy oh, we got that one. one. Okay. Yeah. Where your daughter, where you picked your daughter up. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I'm still, I'm still upset about that. Like, I'm still like, why of all days? So. She's a lot better this week. <laughs> oh, it's a constant evolution. Yeah. So, context. yeah. So they, you know, so they always ask for a lot of parents participation with their kids. And I'm like, no, I send them to school, let them learn, let my daughter. Okay. She found, she finds another friend and she shuns her other friend and then she starts drama. And she's upset. I'm like, fix your, fix your hot mess. I'm not doing yeah. it for you. Bye. And she, you so you fostered her and then adopted her. Tell me about that day for you guys. So that day, um, fostering, we first of all, fostering is it has a lot of challenges. Um, you have a lot of people in your house. There's a lot of nitpicking about what you do, and you get a little frustrated because. It's almost like, hey, we have a kid here that's doing pretty well. Uh, We're not the most perfect parents, but could you please stop telling us to do X, Y, and Z, or we need to do this? And now don't get me wrong, children in the foster care system, they're they're children of trauma. So they, they develop differently. You know, there's a whole bunch of data about how their brain patterns work and all that. And we, and we learned that, but my husband and I are very methodical in our approach. You know, we're military people, we set boundaries, we, we can be disciplinaries, but we also observe and, and look at things and watch how things trigger and, and that. So I think with social workers, you know, they have this one can SOP 
like you must follow this path. And we're like, no, that doesn't make sense. Like, <laughs> and so with us, I think that caused a lot of friction. So, um, however, she was improving <laughs> with her attitude. You know, she was a, she was a child when we first got her, she'd have a math pro she'd have math problems, 20 math problems, like five plus three and, you know, addition below 10. And she would throw a tantrum for like two hours, two hours. And we'd sit there, we'd work with her. And then when she finally did the work, it would take two minutes. I, I have like, one of those, by the way. I was like, what? <laughs> so we would go through this, but, you know, she's I, I will tell you now between when we first got her, m- you know, month zero, month one to now, you know, 14 months in. I mean, she's in school. She's doing her homework. She's checking her homework. Um, you know, she's smart. She's really, really smart. And she's smart beyond the skills, the survival skills that she had, manipulation, deception, lying, all that stuff. And she's understanding that there's more rewards if you go not be lazy about it, if you're if you go in the right way. So um, there is, you know, we have a long way to go, but she's improved. So to answer the question, the the adoption day was awesome because it was right before her birthday. Um, It was in person, so we were able to, you know, go and and see it. And we kind of made it a special day for her. And it was also the day that I didn't have to see another social worker again. So I was really happy about that. I was like, get out of my house. I don't have to see a lawyer. I don't have to see a court appointed special agent. I don't have to see social worker A, B, C, and D. Bye. Like we all had a great relationship, but it, it was a lot. It was just, it was a lot. And so it's like having the IG in your house every day. Yeah, it's like doing. Yeah, it's like doing an audit. You know, <laughs> it's like doing an audit three times a month. It was wow. it was exhausting, but it was worth it. You know, she's she's a great kid. Um, she has, you know, she was a kid that went from not knowing, not wanting to be a doctor because it was too hard, to now wanting to be a vet. You know, she does jujitsu. She she's taking piano lessons. She does swim lessons. She's excited to be on the swim team. Like. This is a kid now that sees a future. And before, you know, she was just trying to get through day to day. So it was kind of, it's kind of nice. Well, it's great. I think it's wonderful. I have a good friend who, um, my writing partner, her name is also Liz. We all have these friends named Liz. Liz. Um, she, uh, she and her partner have fostered 26 children and, um, they have adopted three, uh, that they've had for many years. So I know they would identify with some of the challenges that you went through. Um, And it feels like it really kind of all ties into sort of what you're trying to do with this book. You know, it's, it it all seems to fit your life mission um, really neatly. Uh, What is your vision for, I mean, I think you said at the end of the book that you uh, some of the proceeds from the book go to charity. Um, You talk about wanting to help, kids get out of whatever rut that they're in. Um, So what's your vision for how to execute that? So the vision, I mean, yeah, I want to mentor people. I want to, I want to walk the talk, right? So people, especially during COVID, I mean, a lot of people went into foster care, a lot of bad things came out when people were isolated, right? So um, I just want to show kids, young folks who think that they have no future, that there is a a possible future. There's different ways that you can go about doing that. Just because you were dealt a bad hand or just because you came from the Bronx or you came from this family doesn't mean you can't be amazing and you can't be awesome and you can't fly what you want. You can't be an astronaut in the stars. You can't do a reality show or you can't be a singer or do whatever. Right. So, um, I want to show that and I want to show, you know, people say, oh, we need to help and we need to do this and that. Okay, so, all right, you want to help kids? All right, we fostered to adopt. It was a pain in the butt system, but we did it. Now, what are you going to do? You're going to keep talking about it or you're going to do something? And I'm not saying, look, fostering is not for everyone. Adoption is not for everyone. 
but big brother and big sister could be for some, right? You could reach, you could do another program. You can, you know, my proceeds go to Legacy Flight Academy. You can be involved in, if you're a pilot flying, you know, kids out in Compton or in other places in Sacramento and take them on a flight and change their perspective about how they, they can live and how they could grow up. So what little thing can you do? You know, if you have that one grain of sand in life and the hourglass of life, what are you going to do with it? So that's what I'm trying to do. That's great. You mentioned being on a re- reality TV series, which yeah. we haven't <laughs> talked about yet. And, you know, there are lots of great interviews. Um, well, I mean, I guess I jumped in on one that you were doing with Phil Keegan. And I don't know if that's recorded for people to watch anywhere, but um, he has such lovely things to say about you and working with you. I always love to see that. I enjoyed um, watching. I, you know, I don't do normal TV usually, but when I found out that you were going to be on the show, you know, I was texting you too, cause I was an hour ahead of you and you were like, what happened? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oops, <laughs> I didn't know she didn't watch it. <laughs> so uh, it's okay. Uh, it was, um, it was, it was interesting to see how they edited the show yeah, and what yeah. they picked on. So I was like, Oh, okay. All right. All right. They did a good editing job. So, yeah, they What's... portrayed everyone. They portrayed everyone very well. And I think Phil, I mean, Phil and Louise Kogan are phenomenal people. Oh, I said his name wrong. Kogan. Sorry. Oh, I'm just, it might, good. Well, yeah. So they, they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're phenomenal. They're phenomenal folks. They, uh, they were true when they said, look, you're here because you have this story you're in great shape. You represent America and you have these inspirational stories and we want to share it. And, you know, when you see other reality shows like uh, Joe Millionaire or Love Island, it's a lot of drama. So going into this, I was a little nervous because I was like, man, um, I'm trying to build something and I'm trying to represent. And if I don't act right, this could, <laughs> this could, uh, you know, this could ruin me. (laughs) So. Yeah. Well, so how did that, how did you um, take that into consideration? You, you know, it's, you just want to represent yourself in a good way. So when we're being filmed, I mean, it's, it's a long day We're we're mic'd up the whole time. They hear everything that you say. So you just, I had to conduct myself in a way that reflected well a uh, good order and discipline yeah um yeah. for for myself because that's you know most of the time that's how it is but you're in a situation where it's physically demanding you're exhausted it's highly emotional and you have to show some restraint right so but there's times that you know i don't want to say it is what it is but sometimes you you just let it out and i and i did I don't know. There were times I was frustrated. They, they did not, I don't think they, they posted any of that. They did show the fact about my road rage, which I was like, really? When I was driving. Yeah. And I would, and I would have all these comments. I'm a New Yorker. This is, <laughs> there's some things I couldn't change. Like there's some things I could change. Like I would, yeah, I was, uh, I, I was driving rage. I, it wasn't, it was just, normal you know monologuing about the traffic yeah my (laughs) my uh, my inner monologue was coming out coming out but i was i was in la i i was used to driving in la living in palmdale and i was they're so annoying driving in california like that they're so annoying i know it frustrates me so much that's so funny it's like that was the only place i could control myself that's so funny (laughs) man but i you know i just you know i just said meryl be yourself and be who you are and and i i lived up to that yeah well it was really fun getting to know you through that um and watching you like 
where you started and and going through it and just all of the dynamics and you're right that show was lovely because it wasn't a whole lot of of drama you know artificially created interpersonal drama it was people under pressure trying to you know and your true character I think I mean I can't imagine anybody who could go through that uh that their true character didn't uh, reveal itself at some point in the show. Um, how long was the filming? I, I can't tell you exactly how long, but it's, it was several weeks. Um, yeah. Like we, I was trying to put it in the context of like an officer candidate school or a boot camp. Like how does it compare? Cause it feels like that kind of environment, you know, a little bit. So it's, it's probably as long as boot camp, and it was, it was, I mean, every day we, uh, every day we were competing. So it yeah. was um, it was like hard labor every day because these, you know, they they condense everything into one hour yeah. and that's with dialogue and getting to know people. But I mean, seriously, some of those some of our events took two, three hours. Yeah. And it was um, I remember the slime eel challenge. One, I was so angry. I was like, I was mad at Phil. I was like, seriously, I was like, bro, this is gross. <laughs> when he pulled it out, like at first he put his hand in the bucket and then he did this. And he pulled it out. I yeah. was like, what is that? Like in my mind, I said, I was like, Meryl, don't freak out. Don't freak out on camera. Don't freak out on camera. No, okay, just look and 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 how we're going to deal with this. Like in my, <laughs> in my head and we touched it and I'm like, okay, it doesn't feel that bad. Um, but this is gross. And then when we saw the bins and where we had to run back and forth, I go, I looked in the bin and in my mind, I'm like, there's about 300 of these things in here, three to 400. I said, oh my gosh. I was like, if I get like, in my mind, I was calculating. I was like, if I could get 10 in at a time and we're running back and forth, this is about, I was like, this is about a you know, quarter, quarter mile. I said, oh my gosh. We're doing in my mind, I was like, we're doing like three miles of running and walking to the back and forth. Like I was like, okay, this is a game of endurance, just marathon, not a sprint. Like in your mind, this is what I was doing, calculating. It's yeah, it was a pretty gross. I thought that that was funny that that one got you though, too. Like, I don't know. Cause there were you it, have a lot of interesting things. I don't know. I guess that probably was the grossest one though. It was, it was the grossest because of the slime and they gave us these little bags to put them in and they were like, you can't kill them because yeah. my first thought was like, I will bludgeon them to death and then just put as many in. And they were like, you can't leave them on the ground. You can't step on them. I'm like, they're like, Peter will be mad. I'm like, OK. OK, yeah. That's yeah, so, yeah. So oh, it was it was disgusting. I mean, I, it wasn't that disgusting to me. I mean, I had them in my shirt, so. <laughs> yeah, that's gross. That's so gross. Phil looked at me. He's like, uh-uh. I'm like, well, oh, it's, it's gameplay. There we go. Yeah, got to get it done. The box. Uh, how, so, how yeah, did that, the experience, like, really affect your life? You know, now you've had plenty of time to reflect on that at, at this point. I did. Um, how did it? Well, first of all, it, it got my story out to so many people and I and I can I'm forever grateful to the show for that. Um, the experience was so intense. I mean, I'm still it, it brought back memories of being in the military, going out, whether it's in the Navy on a deployment with my debt or going out flying U2s with a group of guys. Um, it was intense in that way where you form these tight bonds so quickly because you have the shared experience. So it was very nostalgic to me, especially after being out of the military for, you know, about 18 months. Um, it's, you know, the assimilation, the assimilation back into civilian life as a military person is, can be difficult. Um, you just have a way of thinking and now you get back to where people are kind of, eh, uh, so so uh, there's no there's no definitive yes no it's like well maybe or I'll get back to you whenever yeah. and it's one of those things that makes you grit your teeth because it's not the norm 
and you want to choke, you straight up want to choke people out. Like when I'm <laughs> when I'm working, I mean, I'm be honest. I work at a gym. And people just can't even be on time. And then I watch management and I watch how management treats people and I watch the things they say. And in my mind, I have to walk away because the colonel is like trying to come out like yes. there would like an exorcism would have to happen because I'm, <laughs> I want to spin my head because I'm like, I cannot believe you just said that to that individual. I can't believe you talked to them that way. And I can't believe you're a grown adult older than me doing that to someone else. Yeah, that's. So that's a hard transition. And I think in some cases, you, when you're in the military, you have this mission, you have this focus, and now that's gone. And that can also be a little bit hard to manage, kind of daunting. Um, it's I, disorienting I get, a little, right? Yes, it's disorienting. You get some spatial D, right? Because yeah. Because you... You're, you're not sure which way is up. You're not sure if you're going the right way. You're not sure if you're going to get the job. You're not sure why they think of you this way. They, like civilians are not forthright, forthright with you, right, in a way. Yeah. And then you have to, there's a lot of drama that's surrounding it and you, and you just don't understand. So um, doing this show kind of just was, you know, put a lot of things in perspective for me in terms of, yeah, there are people out there who work hard, yeah. bust their butt, are emotional, but they're, they're very focused and they want to do things. So that, that gave me some hope, like, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I could I, see I, that. I could see I that, especially it. with that crew of people for sure. Yeah. I yeah. was able to take a deep breath and go, okay, everyone out here is not cray cray. Who's not a non-military person. Like, <laughs> That first year was tough. I mean, there was just days I would just sit like I work out and I would just sit on my bench just thinking like, is this it? Is this all life is? Yeah. And I'm sure people have thought about that, but yeah. Yeah. That's a really interesting perspective. The way that we process our military experience when you've been in as long as you were, um, as long as I was. It's a, it's an evolution for sure. And then when you think about people coming back from combat tours and how, um, you know, abrupt it is to be immersed in a totally new environment and try to adjust to that. You know, yeah. So if, if it was hard for you or hard for me, you know, yeah. Yeah. Imagine, you know, yeah. Imagine the person coming back from their fifth combat tour. Right. Nothing makes sense. Right. Like nothing nothing makes sense. And then you, you start to doubt, I, I would think you'd start to doubt everything, even your own existence. Like why? So um, it's, it's hard. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah. Well, you seem to be uh, finding ways to navigate it. And I am too, you know? Um, so the next thing that I'd like to talk to talk to you about, and we have we have been talking forever. Um, and so if you need a break, please take one and then I'll do some edits to this. So I am going to split this up. Um, just, I want to talk a little bit about the actual production of the book um, okay. for people who uh, haven't, you know, who don't necessarily want to write and publish one themselves, but, and who need a little help with that. And I want to make sure that they have examples like you. But for me, like I retired to write full time. Um, I enjoy writing. I love it, but it's very isolating. And I, and in the year of the COVID and the writing, I was able to kind of connect with what were the things that I was missing um, from being on active duty. Cause I don't miss everything. Right. I really don't. I do enjoy having my freedom. I do enjoy not, you know, working for, organizations that give me no resources and exp expect the world from me. And, and every day I'm making choices about how to fail. Like I don't miss that, you know? <laughs> um, Absolutely. I like having some command of my own life and my own time and being able to make decisions about how I use it. But I missed mentoring, networking, helping people connect people with, you know, not just where they knew they wanted to go, but 
ideas that maybe they didn't even think about that were possible for them. You know, I loved that part of being in leadership is like, you know, helping people connect the dots because that's what people did for me. When I enlisted, I never imagined I was going to go to officer candidate school, go to flight school, go to Harvard, like never go be the senior defense official in a foreign country. Like none of those things were even, you know, a, well, flying was my dream, but none of those other things were. And so I missed the point is that I missed, you know, that being able to be that for somebody else to help connect them to their opportunities that are available. And so I've been able to like combine this, this flying uh, thing, which I love and the writing thing into something that I think will just keep me busy for the rest of my life, <laughs> you know, and allow me to do some of that stuff. So, yeah. So um, I agree with you. So yes, I don't, I miss the flying, but I could do commercial, you know, commercially, you know, yeah. just privately. Um, I like the mentorship cause I get to do it. Um, I don't miss, Hey, you're getting ready for deployment. Your mm. UDM unit was it unit deployment manager. You need to do anti-terrorism training and, uh, right. this training and you need to, what else you need <laughs> to make sure that your cat car won't expire. Cause you haven't done your cyber stuff. Oh, ah! the, all the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't miss that. But yeah, you're right. In the civilian world, what I love is that I could translate a lot of my military experience to here. And, you know, when when you when we network with people and we say we're going to call and be on time, we're going to call and be on time. Yeah. We're going to give them we give them a product. They're like, holy cow, what what is this? Yes. Right. When I have to do uh, if I have to do a PowerPoint presentation for presenting to some people and I do and they go. Wow, that's really good. Yeah, well, because I've been PowerPointing for yeah. over 20 years. <laughs> so professional. Yes. A lot of yeah. Intel briefs. <laughs> yes. So now that, yeah, so there is, I mean, there is definitely a lot of silver linings in it. Yeah. But thank you so much for taking the time with me. We took a lot of time, but. Um, I've been really excited about this and you have so much to offer. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you for having me and, and listening to me. I hope, I hope people learn some stuff from it or learn a little bit more yeah. uh, about me. Thanks so much for listening and for joining in the discussions in the Aviatrix book club. Please join us next month when we will discuss the book, A Pair of Wings, which is an historical fiction novel based on the life of Bessie Coleman by Carol Hobson who I have already interviewed, so you can check out her interview on the Aviatrix Book Review website and podcast. Blue skies and happy reading, everyone.